Hey guys, Filthy Robot here, continuing our campaign with Arumba and EU4, where uh, you were telling me we made two years. Yeah, two whole years almost. We're two months shy of two years right now. That's started so, in... So good, we're so fast. Are we the fastest <laughs> players to ever play this game, you think? No, by far no. That was five episodes and we're on two years in. I thought let's, that was uh, good. Let's wait at least here until our navy is in Irisher, and then we'll keep... And how, how young were you when you started playing this game? <laughs> uh, in general, it was three years ago when the game came out. And that's just been one one game you completed, or more? Uh, just the one, yeah. Alright. <laughs> so our navy is in Irish here. Let's go ahead and group them up. Uh, go ahead and box select the 18 navies, the 18 yep. ships. And then uh, press, actually, I got this okay, come now. Press the G key to consolidate the two armies into one. So now they're a singular navy, they'll move together. Okay. Next up, we need to talk about generals and uh, actually being ready to declare war. So we've got this army, right? We've got uh, yep. 10,000 infantry, um, we've got 3,000 cavalry, and uh, they're going to be pretty good at their job, but we can put a leader in charge to make them even stronger. We probably so, have to pay this leader, right? Uh, yes and no. We have to pay him, but in monarch points. Okay. So press F1 and then press the comma key to go to the military tab. Okay. You can see that we have um, below all of the, the unit information to the right, there's this thing where it says zero leaders. Yeah, zero to two. Zero to two. So we're allowed to have two leaders. Um, we have none currently appointed. And then at the very bottom of this interface, there's three different buttons that are allowed right now. We've got Recruit a General, we've got Recruit an Admiral, and we've also got Make a, a General out of your Ruler. You see okay. the ones that are available? Yeah. The Recruit a General costs 50 military points. The Recruit an Admiral costs 50 diploma dip diplomatic points. Each of these will count as a Ruler against the 0 out of 2 leader limit. Rulers do not count against the leader limit. So the advantage okay. to making your ruler into a leader is that he will be um, a free leader. And if he's got a particularly high military score, he can actually be significantly stronger uh, relative to the other generals you might be able to hire right now. So if he's got and like he a, He's got a military skill of two, which isn't yeah, particularly great. Not that okay. great, yeah. So he's not going to be particularly good. Plus, if you have your ruler as a general and he dies while you're at war or while doing a siege, you take a, a an extra stability hit upon ruler death. Normally, and we don't have a hair. We don't have an heir, right? So. Yeah, that would be bad. Um, okay. Normally you lose one stability when your ruler dies, as a Catholic nation, or really as any nation that's under our government type, but you would lose two um, if you make him into a, into a ruler. So it's really a desperation play or someone who's really, really strong. So we're not going to want to click any of these buttons because we're actually going to go and look at something completely separate, which um, is... Well, let me stop you before you, let me, before you do that quite yet. Yeah, I just had a quick question. Mm -hmm. so, um, so it says recruiting a general cost me 50 cross swords, and I see a cross swords icon at the top called Military Power by Scotland. Mm -hmm. Is that actually costing us one quarter of our total military power to recruit a general? Yes. Okay. We've recruited 208 since the beginning of the game, and it would cost us 50 to hire him. Okay, got it. If we had right. three out of two leaders, we would also spend one monarch point per month for every leader you are over your limit. Okay. So, um, what we're going to do, though, is we're going to go and we're going to interact with an estate. We haven't talked about this at all. I've tried to avoid it because it can be very confusing, and we don't want to interact with it too much because I just don't want to bog you down. I'll we'll go ahead yeah. and press F1, and then press the, uh, the quotation key or the apostrophe key. Yeah. That's the farthest rightmost tab, the estates tab. We've got yep. three estates in our country. We've got the burghers, the clergy, and the, and the nobility. Basically, these are... If you're not playing with all of the DLC that we're using, we're using every single DLC, you might not even have estates enabled. It's, a, it's a, an extra content pack that Paradox did a while back. Having estates um, gives you various benefits. Um, Provinces that are controlled by estates will have modifiers to them um, and stuff like that. But what we're going to do is we're just going to take advantage of the nobility right now. So you see that interactions button to the right of nobility? Yep. Why, how did you get to knowing that it would be the nobility that you want to interact with here? Uh, just by reading them all. You can you can take your time if you want. I mean, you could even do some of these if you'd be interested. In. Let's go from the top down. Why not? Go ahead and start with burgers. So you open right, up the okay. interactions with burgers. We've got a few options. Ask for contribution, grant monopoly charters, demand diplomatic support, etc. Okay. Notice how some of them are grayed out. We don't meet yeah. the criteria to do it. So the two we can choose from right now, we could grant monopoly charters, which would sacrifice prestige to increase their influence and loyalty. We don't really want to do that, because that would cost us prestige. We need the prestige for war, because we want high, high morale of armies. But, yeah, but we, uh, could, we could bleed them for cash. Yeah, it would take their loyalty from 50 down to 40. The, the general range you want your your uh, estates to be in is between 40 and 60. Um, okay. As long as it's above 40, nothing's going bad. So 40 is actually a great threshold. Go ahead and ask him for some money. It's a great idea. Give me, give me money. Do it. All right. Okay. Their loyalty is going to trend toward 50. So by not doing that interaction, you're actually missing out on a resource, which is the recovery rate you could be experiencing if they were below 50. 
So they only recover when they're below 50? They, they, go they, above they trend toward 50. If they're above 50, okay. they go down. If they're below 50, they go up. Okay. So In terms of how quickly they recover? Just in general, they will always trend toward 50. Okay. The lower they are, the faster they recover. The higher they are, the faster they go down. So the clergy, let's go look at their interactions then. Yeah. We could give them money. That sounds less great. Yeah. Neither... We seek the support. We lose prestige and legitimacy. Yeah. Neither of these the particularly why, appealing. Why do we want to boost the... It says... All right. So both of those seem negative to me. It says, okay, we lose five prestige and lose five legitimacy. And the, cler the clergy estate gains 10 influence. And yep. the clergy estate gains 15 loyalty. Is this setting up for making better use yes. of their other ones? Okay. Yep. So, for instance, there's there's some very notable breakpoints. Remember I mentioned that between 40 and 60 is where you want to stay? Yeah. If you can get above 60 loyalty, then you actually get an extra modifier. So hover over, um, you see where next to the clergy it says national tax modifier plus 10%? Yes. If you hover over that, it says if loyalty is above 60%, we get national tax modifier plus 10, stability cost modifier minus 5, and yearly people influence minus, uh, plus, plus 0.5. Okay. So if we were to raise their loyalty to above 60, we would add the stability costs and the yearly people influence modifiers. We don't currently have those because we're only between 40 and 60. And yeah. you can also see the malice you would ex experience if you're below 40. Okay. And let's go take a look at um, the nobility here. Yep. Called be it. And then one last that? thing again is that uh, in order to be able to do some of these interactions, they have to have at least a minimum number of influence. Since they only have 20, by sacrificing some prestige and legitimacy, we could raise their influence to 30, which would unlock some more interactions. Okay. So, but the one we're really interested in right now, the only reason we're even looking at this at all, is we want to do grant generalship. Okay. This is going to give us a free general with 40 tradition. So we don't have to pay the 50 monarch points to hire him. And what is he's, 40 tradition? What does that mean, gain general 40 tradition? It's going to pretend like our country has 40, uh, sorry, 40 army tradition when it spawns the general. So again, uh, let's go back to the, the military tab, F1, comma. Okay. Top number um, below all the unit information is army tradition, 8.2. Okay. Top number beneath all of... Sorry, say that again. Top number versus... No, oh, I see it. Yep. Yeah. Got it. So army our, tradition. Our army tradition is 8.2. And what that estate is saying is that it's going to spawn a general as if we had 40. Okay. So it's a hell of a lot better than our current... Yes. One Not only do we get him for free, but we also get him um, with much higher army tradition than we currently have. So he's going to be that, significant. And the army tradition modifies, so I can see it says current effects, so it modifies things, like all the things that we care about, siege ability, morale of armies, manpower recovery, recovery army, morale speed. Those are all going to be better with a higher traditioned uh, general. Yes. And one thing that it does not clearly indicate, but was actually released via the developers and is, is widely known now on the Wikipedia article for E4, is that your army tradition also determines how good the generals you have will be. So okay. I'm going to tell you the math. Don't get bogged down with this. Just if you need, to, if you don't want to remember the math or you're not interested in the math, um, just for the viewer here, just know that bigger numbers are better. More army tradition is good. You want more army tradition. <laughs> okay. But the actual breakpoints are this. Every 20 army tradition, you get an extra guaranteed pip on your general. So if you have 20 army tradition, you get one extra guaranteed pip. You have 40 army tradition, you get two extra guaranteed pip. Since we have 8.2, we get zero guaranteed pips. So just the fact that we get a 40 army tradition general from that estate interaction means we're guaranteed two pips. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Beyond that, um, the calculation is as follows. Uh, a D6 is ruled. So you get a random value between zero and six. Beyond that, you get your guaranteed pips from army tradition. So you take your current value, which in this case was, was 8.2, divided by 20 is less than one, so you get no guaranteed pips. So we're somewhere between zero and six right now. Then you roll 8.2 out of 100, so you have an 8.2% chance to get one extra pip. So we could maybe have as many as seven. Then the last part is that you have a 50% chance to get one extra pip just because. So we could have as many as eight pips if we got really lucky. We could also have as, as few as zero if we were super unlucky. Um, although a general can't actually have none, so he would have one. But um, so I'm anyway. totally honest, I did tune out some of that because I was reading yep. the other interactions in yep. notability, but I imagine that would be helpful at a later date when I want the, the details. Yep. So for some people, it's really useful. Just know that the, the, the most thing, main thing, higher numbers are better and be aware of the breakpoints. If you're at 40.1 army tradition and it's decaying over time and you think you might need a general in your future, you should hire now. Don't wait till you're at 39 or less because then you're going to miss out on your guaranteed pip. So go ahead and click the estate interaction and yep, hire a general for us. Well, I was looking at this. So, uh, so we could get a diplomat 
for this as well if we, if we wanted to instead so i was reading i was reading through this and it looks like because i was kind of curious i'm like why is this both giving us something and boosting their influence but it looks like if they get too high of an influence they have a chance to to try to take over the, the country from us yeah that's we bad just instantly lose when that happens no no it's a disaster that can happen and it's dangerous and we're not gonna let that happen but okay. uh granting generalship is going to raise their influence from 20 up to 76.4 which is still less than 80 so we're well well within the, the safety threshold here okay so i clicked um, it now they're at 76 influence yep yeah. now notice how our manpower recovery speed actually just went up from 15 percent to 20 yeah, percent okay. there are breakpoints on the influence as well uh if you are at um, less than 20, 20 to 40, 40 to 60, and above 60. So because we went above 60 influence, now we have an extra increased uh, power to the nobility modifier. So that's why it's higher. It doesn't actually say that in the tooltips anywhere. I don't know why. Okay. Anyway, let's go check him out. Who do we get? We got uh, Wallace Randolph, who is a 225. Press F1, comma. Okay, it's back on the military screen then. Yeah. All right, there he is. Two two five. Where are you? I, okay, if I click on him, it's going to tell me two two five. Because I, yep, I currently just, I can see him, but you see, you see, this is the one leader now, one out of two, and then you see how it's uh, the two two five. He's got one, two fire pips, two shock pips, five oh, maneuver okay, pips, yeah, yeah. zero there siege pips. Numbers for some reason here. These yep. are actually pips. Got it. Remember when I mentioned the word pip? It's uh, a thing I've only ever experienced in these games. Is pips is in in paradox titles. So yes, he's got these pips. Fire value of the unit is a measure of the amount of casualties the units will inflict in the fire phase of combat. Okay, this, we're going to clearly go through this. We're going to so get there. Fire phase, yeah. shock phase, and maneuver. Okay, yep, got so it. So real quick, though, let's just take a look at this. He ended up with nine pips, and he was guaranteed two from having 40 tradition, yep. plus one because we actually are Scotland and we have a, a guaranteed shock pip, which we haven't talked about, but it's not a big deal. So he was okay. guaranteed three pips, and he actually became a nine pip general. So pretty, um, pretty awesome. We got really lucky. What that means is that you are going to click all the buttons in the future because you're apparently you've, you're my lucky charm here. Oh, that was you a, do not you do not want to count on my luck to help you out in these games. This that was, would be the last that was the a, first last and only <laughs> lucky thing that will happen in this campaign. <laughs> that was a very good roll. Uh, it would have been a little bit better if we had more shock pips versus the maneuver pips, but still nine pips overall is very solid, very good. So let's all do right. this. Let's go ahead and appoint him to our army. Go ahead and select the army. Uh, okay, army is now selected. And the top oh, no, it's not. of the selected very top of the, the army, army interface, there's this little red. Red highlighted box that says no leader. Go ahead and click yeah. on that and select Wallace Randolph. Put him in charge. Got it. And now okay. you can see there's a little one star next to our 13k army, which indicates that there is a general in charge. Okay. Let's just briefly talk about these pips. Um, the 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 pips, the fire pip and the shock pip are combat related. They're only going to apply when you're fighting an enemy army. The maneuver pip is um, useful for negating river crossings, straight crossings, and stuff like that. But also, it's an it's a, a hidden plus 25 percent movement speed. One, it's 5% movement increase for every one maneuver. So our yeah. army now moves 25% faster than it used to, which is very, very good. We're um, trying to run away from the English armies, you're saying? Yes. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, we have zero siege pips, which uh, are useful for sieges only. Okay. So anyway, good job on that. Let's uh, let's go ahead and declare the war. Go ahead and just do it. Right. Declare war on Tyrone. We did. Didn't we already declare war? No, we didn't. Not yet. We just spent all that time hiring a general. All right. Okay. Go so, and click and confirm to declare war on uh, Tyrone. This is the place where we have the, the yellow bars, and because we have uh, CB for doing that, we could do so. Yeah, now notice how okay. the army in Tyrone just turned red. Yeah. One day from today, uh, Leinster is going to get their defensive call from arm, call to arms, and they're going to turn red as well. Right now they're still gray because they haven't joined the war yet. Could we have possibly have moved our army into Ulster before declaring war to make it even less of a delay, so less chance of uh, Leinster being to help them? We could have. Unfortunately, because they are not a participant in the war, we would have been black flagged, which is basically where your army is where it's not supposed to be, and no, you can't do that. By being okay. black flagged, you have to return to control the territory, meaning land that you either own yourself, a vassal despite owns... Despite the fact we have military access, we just can't yeah. have an army hanging out there, even though we have military access, we have to have a reason for that military being there. Yeah. I guess so, that makes some sense. So we have the ability to go there now, and we will march through there, but we had to stay in Irishshire in order to not get black flagged. So we, we're actually saving time by not trying to do what you did. Do we, do we need to... Uh use transports here we don't because we have a nope. straight crossing and this means because the other side is friendly and we have this side we can just walk across this with no penalty yep. it is red i thought it was going to change to a, a gray dotted one like in the northwest of our lands yep the uh, gray it, the gray dotted one means that um you okay hover over sutherland or go sorry go to the sutherland province yeah hover in the very top oh, left I corner the army to fucking go there let's yeah. not let that happen yeah, that's wrong right. mm -hmm. click on sutherland okay. province top left corner of the province dialogue you see the little straight crossing indicator again. It's this little arrow over water. Yes. Hover over that and it'll tell you exactly why. The strait is currently passable to your troops. The narrow strait across Moray Firth connects this province to Orkney. And this strait is currently passable. So, um, 
An enemy fleet may block control unless both sides are under allied control. So because we control both sides, that's why that one's gray. We don't control both sides of the Ulster Irishshire Strait. That's why it's red. Okay. So he could blockade us. If his navy was stronger in the Irish Sea, we wouldn't be able to go there. That's why we've put our navy here to guarantee we can cross the strait. Okay. He also well, even a, though he's given us active military access, would he potentially have given us active mm -hmm. military access and then simultaneously be blockading the strait with his army? With his no. navy, rather? Even though Ulster's giving us military access, he is not a participant in the war, and it's not controlled territory. We have military okay. access through it, but it's not controlled, therefore blockades are possible. All right. So we're going to just go ahead and march across here. Let's go back down to speed two. And, but it uh, wouldn't be Ulster blockading us. It would be someone in the Irish Sea. It would be hostile. It, it would be, be Tyrone. Tyrone's navy would have to be Got it. better than ours and positioned in the Irish Sea. But why? Uh, but the Irish Sea. Okay, so the Irish Sea actually can, is both sides of the strait. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yep. No. The Iowa is looking a little bit like a border symbol to me. But no. So our army has now arrived in Ulster. Okay. You can actually see the progress indicator again if you hover over the numbers there. So remember how I mentioned we're probably going to be able to uh, engage the army separately. Looks like yeah. Leinster is, uh, notice how Leinster's army is not fully green. Yeah. He wasn't at full maintenance, and so he's waiting for his morale to be better before he tries to join up with Tyrone. And okay. we were at full maintenance because we knew we were, we, we knew we were going to declare. So yeah. we do get to pick off these armies a little bit separately. Awesome. So I'll let you do the first thing here. Go ahead. Just send them towards Tyrone. Do it. Let's do it. Uh, actually, I have two thoughts here. There's another, I see a fleet, a Tyrone fleet up there. Yep. It looks weak. It's a one, it's one ship. It's one ship, but notice how close it is to the land. Okay. It's actually in port, which means that we can't ah. kill it. Okay. Unless so we I, siege the province, and then that'll force the navy out to sea. So is this now a combat inter interface, or am I? So when I, hey, pause. How is this boat moving? Oh, you're moving it. Okay. I just did it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like bloody boat cheating. All right. So am I right clicking on his army or into his terrain, or what am I doing? On you don't. Yeah. You never click on armies. It's just saying go into that province. Okay. Notice how we may get a crossing penalty. Go ahead and press the Q key. You see a bunch of forests and stuff. Yeah. Press the Q key again. Okay. Now we're in the simple terrain map mode. We can see here that uh, Tyrone has a woods, woods terrain type, which is a negative penalty for us. There's also a river. There's like a blue line between these two provinces. Okay. There's a river crossing between these. But because we have five maneuver and his general is a 1-2-2, one, one, a one, two, two, we have superior maneuver than him. So we okay. will negate the river crossing penalty. Okay. Where would I have seen the, 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 the river crossing? I mean, I see the river, but I just need to know that in general rivers give me a river crossing penalty. Yep. If you cross okay. a river and you have less maneuver or equal maneuver to the defending general, you will experience a negative one penalty. Okay. If you, if you have more maneuver than them, you negate it. And if there is no river, then of course there's no penalty. Okay. Straits are a negative two uh, penalty, and um, landing from a uh, sea tile is also negative two. And that right. one, that one is actually always experienced. I don't think you can negate that even with high maneuver. Okay, one last thing we're going to do here. We're going to grab our 18 ships. We're going to send them out to the North Channel. The reason for that, as you noticed, is that the their navy is hiding in the port of Tyrone. That is the sea tile that his port exists on. Okay. If we want to blockade Tyrone, we need to put our navy in that sea tile. We cannot blockade from the Irish Sea. Are we worried about... Okay, so I guess there is more navy down south from uh, his ally. Yeah. I see three down there. Could they also have boats running around that we don't know about somewhere? Great option or great question. Uh, see the bottom right hand, bot very bottom of the screen, there's a new uh, little flag. Yeah. The Scottish Conquest of Tyrone. That's our war yeah. overview. Left click on that to open it up. Uh, we're hidden in... Ah, damn it. In, in multiplayer, apparently this information is hidden. If we were not playing in uh, multiplayer right now, you'd actually be able to see exact stats for what he has. You still okay. can find this information by going to the ledger, which I'll do really quickly. Um, F1, you go, you press L, F3, and then go to the right one. You can see the total navies. L, F3, right one. Page 19. Okay, navies. And, and you could, it's just sorted by, sorted by country name, it looks like. And who are we fighting again? Uh, Tyrone, right? And the other guy. Tyrone and Leinster. Down. Yeah, it's Tyrone to Tyrone. Leinster has three ships, and Tyrone has... Only three ships as well. So our navy ships and a transport. No, our navy yeah. is very superior. They're not even going to try to engage us. So, but I'm, we only see one of them. Could their light ships be doing something annoying in the meantime? Not really. No. Okay. We have significantly right. more ships and, and significantly larger navy than they do. So we're sending. Well, what I was getting at was, I mean, right now our entire naval fleet is deployed here in the Irish Sea, uh, and we probably don't need our entire naval fleet to beat their fleet. Could we still be uh, grabbing gold with uh, some of our fleet being privateers? Yes, we could. The risk there is, um, you know, what if we get another war declaration on us and our navy is separated? Um, also, what if they somehow get a new ally or personal union fires or like okay, some so other just for stuff? safety's sake for now. Generally speaking, when you're at war, you want your navy to be together. Um, okay. 
And same thing with armies. You don't want to have a lot of armies all spread out. It's very easy to get a lot of wasted troops if you are um, not careful. So we'll unpause. We're going to engage them on the 18th of October. And we're going to go down to speed 2 here and wait till... Bam! We have engaged in that province. So um, let's go ahead and click on that. Now you see we have two armies in the same province. They are not ho they're hostile to each other, so they're going to engage in combat automatically. Okay. We have 12.9k versus 4.8k. You can see the morale bars. You can see uh, the fire, fire plus one, terrain minus one, that kind of stuff. Go ahead and click on the actual dialogue itself, and now you can see a provincial like battle dialogue. Do you see it in the bottom left oh, corner? Oh, I think I dismissed the dialogue. Is there somewhere to get that back? Just click anywhere on those two armies. Okay. You see in the bottom left-hand corner, there's now a battle of Tyrone? Yes. All right, top left-hand corner. There's a little right. Uh, it's a white flag with a red cross through it. Okay. That is the retreat indicator. You may not retreat until October the 30th. It is not possible, okay. nor would it be honorable, to retreat from a battle in the first 12 days. So, once 12 days have passed, you are allowed to retreat if you don't like the combat. But for 12 days, we are engaged, guaranteed, no matter what. Which, what are um, these little X's down here? The fire mm, X's. <laughs> those are our troops. Well, obviously. Hold on, sorry, just a second. Is there some way to turn off the uh, no. noisy kind of... You could you could lower all of your volume. You could go to game options, audio, and then just lower like uh, I think it'd be under effects. All right. I'm not gonna do that right now uh, because I don't want to do it for the other effects. But okay, this is interesting. So this is the actual layout of the the units in this battle. Yeah. So you can see. Um, okay, we got two grids lined up against each other, right? We've got yeah. five. They've got a total of five troops. They've got four X's and one slash. The slash represents cavalry. The X's represent infantry. Cannons would be a dot if they existed. If we had any artillery. So he's got four um, four X's in the center with one cav on the right flank. We've got five infantry in the center with cavalry engaging on the flanks. Okay. So if you hover over any of those, you can actually see the engageable targets. Infantry have a flanking range of one, which means they can engage the unit directly across from them, plus one flank or one tile to either side. Okay. You see those little uh, yeah, highlighted the boxes? boxes lighting up. Yep. Cavalry have a default flanking range of two, so that means that they can engage the unit directly in front of them plus two tiles to either side. As the game goes on, they will get modifiers that increase their flanking range. So and... why then, if I look, I see uh, the back row can also engage? Yep, we have five why extra infantry. Why is that one infantry. guy off on the side, that one infantry? Why is he way off on the side, not able to engage anything where, where there's a spot in the middle he could be engaging from? Well, he's in the second row, which means that he is actually not able to engage. Oh. Look at the front when line. I mess, when I mess over the second row and the other ones, it actually shows us giving me highlights the engagement on the other side yep if he if the if infantry in front of him dies he will move into the front line and then he will engage those targets okay but he cannot move into the front line if he moved say to the right of the existing cavalry then he would not be able to flank far enough and so that's yeah, why no, he's I, just... I understand that i just didn't understand that the second row nope. couldn't engage but i still don't understand then why he'd be deployed I, I assume we can't control the deployment nope. correct no nope. deployment's automatic so why is he why is that one infantry on the far the, so far out why is he behind our other infantry to replace them Especially in the center one that engages three of them. He's trying to flank, but he can't. Okay, got it. If another army, let's say Leinster's army, moves in and, and joins the battle, they will fill yep. the front line, and then we would want more infantry to engage on the sides of our, our cavalry. Okay. Nine times out of ten, the back row is going to be comprised of artillery. Front row is going to be comprised of infantry and cavalry, but because we're in the early game and we don't have artillery, uh, it's just a slog between infantry and cavalry. Okay. Okay, briefly here, let's talk about some of the numbers here. We've got, um, we're on the top. You can see our leader, Wallace. If you hover over his name, you can see his stats again, 225. We're fighting against a general named Torin o Reif He is a 1221. See what I'm talking about? Yep. Okay. So, remember how I talked about the game being based on a board game and dice rolls? Yeah. Every phase of combat, each phase of combat lasts three days. You start in the fire phase, and you rotate. Fire phase, shock phase, fire phase, shock phase. Over and over and over again until the combat's over. Always fire first, always um, going to rotate back and forth. It'll never go double fire, never go double shock. It'll never start with shock. It's always fire. And they always last three days. Okay. Every combat phase, you get a D9. It's actually a D10 roll. So you can roll somewhere between 0 and 9. It's a random number that you get. And then beyond that, you get your, your modifiers to fire and terrain. We have plus one from fire because our guy is a two two five, their guy is a one two two. So we have one extra fire pip over their general, which means in every single fire phase we're going to get a plus one to the roll. Okay. Two minus one equals one. Got it. Yep. In every single shock phase we're going to have no modifier for either army because they have sh two shock, we have two shock. 
Okay. Maneuver doesn't factor in here at all, except for negating river crossings, and then we have the negative one because we're attacking him into the woods. Okay. Beyond that, we've got discipline, we've got morale, and tactics. Bigger numbers are usually better. <laughs> we are equal is what's important right now. 100% discipline versus 100% discipline. However, take a look at that morale. We have 2.86 morale. They only have 2.46. They have negative okay. prestige. Remember how we've been like pushing to keep our prestige high? We hired the morale yeah. of armies guy. This is going to represent a significant numerical um, advantage. We're going to inflict more damage. We can fight for longer. And he's also entering the battle with far less morale than we are. He's actually only at 1.65 out of his maximum of 2.86. Well, 2.86 is ours. So he's he's so way, way number, lower. The morale number, why is that not modified by the fact it's coming in at half morale? I mean, I see the bar that you can see the differences, but I, on the right with the trumpet, I don't see... Yep. Hover over his morale on the bottom. It says his yep. maximum is 2.46. If you hover over the actual green bar at the center, though, he's currently at 1.65. Mm -hmm. So he came into the fight not fully, like, maintenanced up. His army was not ready to fight to begin yeah. with. If it was, he would at be he would be at a current morale of uh, 2.46, but he's only at 1.65. And our maximum of 2.86 is setting the overall bar higher. So we're going to crush him. We've got more morale, we do more damage, we can fight for longer, and we've got more men, and we're flanking. Okay. So, um, let's go ahead and let a couple days pass here. So, our first roll, by the way, we rolled a 4 versus his 3. So, that's that's okay. The bigger the number is, the better. You can actually see okay. every day, look at the numbers passing. We've just killed 140. 7 to 5. Yeah, we just actually rolled a, a 7 minus 1 is 6 versus a 5. In the shock phase, shock phase is where cavalry excel. So, we're going to be doing a very good job here. And, bam, stack wipe, he's already dead. Oh, so, it took okay. like 8 days, his entire army has been wrecked he's just destroyed and the way that a stack wipe happens is if you can reduce their morale down to zero within the first two phases of combat so because he was not allowed to shatter he was not allowed to retreat right the yeah. 12 days hadn't passed we actually crushed his morale so fast that he got down to zero before the 12 days had, had transpired and so his army is just dead hmm. now we have the battle of tyrone summary we've gained 1.56 prestige we've gained one army tradition We've also gained a little bit of war exhaustion because we lost some men. We lost 862 infantry. That's going to come out of our manpower pool to replenish over time. He lost prestige. He gained more army tradition than we did, which is supposed to represent the fact that uh, you learn more from your mistakes than from your victories. And he gained one war exhaustion because we killed all of his men. Okay. Is, so that does is, the uh, general die with his, with his army there? Or does his general nope. get out? Nope, the general's fine. He, if, he, if he actually somehow gets another army, he, he'll still have that general. Okay. So... We're going to have to put in a cut here, though, but uh, that was very good. We're already done with that army. We're going to want to go kill the Leinster army next and go from there. Sounds good. See you guys soon. See you in a bit. Thanks for watching.